Hello, everyone. Uh, is the microphone on? Can everyone hear me okay? Hello? It's on? Okay. Um, please be seated, everyone. We'll get started so that we can get out to the snow on the way home. I'm Paul Austin. I'm the, the president of Scarborough Land Trust now. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our annual meeting. Uh, it's been a very good year uh, and a very, very busy year. I don't know, people are saying they can't hear me, so I'm not sure what. The microphone is it's turned on. Does that help? Does that do it? I don't know. Did I do it? Okay, thank you. Good, that's it. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we've been very busy this year. Tonight is really a, a celebration of, of our latest acquisition. It's Warren Woods. Um, there are two or three names. That's the, that's the informal name we've been calling it. Jeremy will talk a little bit more about it later. Um, we have a, a formal name also. Uh, we've now conserved 1,200 acres in the town of Scarborough in 30, 35 years. Um, the Warren property is 156 acres. It's a property that we've we've been attracted to for a long time and we're really happy that we've been able to acquire it. Um, I'd like to recognize um, a number of ex-board members and founding board members. Um, I see Harvey and Becky here as founding board members and I wonder if there's anyone else. I don't see, I don't know if, Tom, were you a founding board member or just a, not founding? And then we have a bunch of Bass board members here. We have Laureen Sedgley. Raise your hand, Laureen. And Tom Daly. And let's see, I thought I saw someone else here. Not sure. And I'd like to show, introduce some of the, the present board members. We have two or three people that weren't able to attend tonight for various reasons. Um, Rick Cheney is our clerk. He's an attorney at Drummond Woodson. He serves on our acquisitions committee, and he's served generally my sounding board and, and reality check. Uh, Patrick O'Reilly is our treasurer. Patrick's been a wonderful, a wonderful boon to the land trust. He's a CPA at McDonald Page, manages our finances, and it's, it's, he's just doing a wonderful job, and he's one of the unsung heroes in the land trust because he's always doing something but nobody knows about it except the people who get paid. Um, Mark Fallensby is a, a toxicologist and he has a part-time uh, vermiculture business. Uh, look at his website, it's Worm Mania, Worm Mania. He does uh, composting, uh, small scale composting under, under your sink. Um, Mark unfortunately wasn't able to attend tonight. Um, Jeremy Winterstein is a lifelong board member and, and one of our hardest workers. Uh, um, we're really happy to have Jeremy involved. He's an independent conservation consultant and he chairs the acquisition committee and co-chairs the Broad Turn Farm Committee and serves on the development and communications committee. Um, Alex Timpson wasn't able to attend. He's an investment advisor with Wells Fargo and advises the development and communications committee. And Elizabeth People is, Peoples is our vice president, and she has a private law firm, her own private law firm, and she's on the acquisitions committee, and she wasn't able to make it tonight either. Um, Tom Hall is here tonight, our town manager, and the town and the land trust have a very close working relationship on various acquisition projects and all kinds of other things. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have to have the, the relationship that we do have with the town. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without that. Um, the Friends of, of Scarborough Marsh, we work closely with them. I see C.D. Armstrong, who's an ex-member of their board. I don't know a lot of the other members. They've changed some, uh, but, but we're, we're very appreciative of the work that they do. And the friends made a very generous gift to the to the Warren project, which was was uh, a wonderful a wonderful surprise for us, and we really appreciate that. Um, and most of all, our donors and our volunteers, um, we can provide the engine 
but we need donors and, and friends to provide the fuel for the engine. Um, we, we can get the work done, but things cost money, and we, we have to have that to, to survive. So thank you very, very much for your contributions. Um, the highlights of the year, I, I'm not even sure that I can uh, that I can go through all the highlights. So many things, so many things happened this year. Um, this this has to be the busiest year we've ever we've ever had. Um, we welcomed our new executive director, Kathy Mills, who is somewhere in the back right there. Um, about a year ago, and Kathy, we immediately threw her in up to her ears, or probably over her ears, way over her head. She's, she's done a pretty good job of recovering from it, though. And uh, in June, the town approved the land bond application for the Warren project, which was a, a great step for us. Uh, we had, during the summer, we had a, a two or three fundraisers of various kinds to help support the Warren project and to help the, to help the land trust, just general operating expenses. We had our first ever broad turn farm dinner uh, farm to food dinner. We had 160 people in September come to a sold out event at Broadturn Farm under the tent, which was, a, 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 by any standard, just a wonderful, wonderful event. It was a, a great friend raiser and a great, and a, a, a limited fundraiser, but a wonderful friend raiser. And the proceeds from that went to the Broadturn Farm Building Fund. And um, that's if you know what a black hole is, you know what the Broad Turn Farm Building Fund is like. Um, I think that was probably the first identified black hole. Um, the science has found some others later, but that was the that was probably the first one. And I think the Missouri's knew that too, uh, because we're we're working on 40 year we're catching up with 40 years of deferred maintenance from the last owners. We don't even have a chance yet to defer maintenance for ourselves. Uh, October. Uh, we started working with the town. Uh, we're, the town is, is deeding some property near the Wiley Recreation Area to the Land Trust as mitigation property for the Wentworth School. Um, their ability to deed that to us and preserve that, it's, it's going to be uh, a, a New England Cottontail Habitat project as well as some other, some other, uh, some other things, uh, but the ability for us to, to accept that property and for the town to be able to deed that to us, save the town, I don't know, 150 or $70,000 or something like that, that they would have had to buy land or donate to a fund elsewhere. So it was a great, it was a great opportunity for us to help out the town and for the town to, to uh, save some money on the Wiley School Project, or Wentworth School Project, so I'm really thrilled about that. Uh, we, we did a major project at Broadturn Farm to reside the long barn uh, so we have essentially two sides of that done, and we're now we're, we're working on funding for the roof on Broadturn Farm, which on the Long Barn, which is a, an enormous, enormous expense for us. It's the, I won't say the last big expense, but it's, it's one of the largest single expenses that we'll have there is that project. Uh, December, we closed on the Warren property. Um, somewhere I have a list here of of things that Jeremy did. Uh, he worked with the land bond acquisition. He uh, had many, many conversations with the family, uh, helped the land surveyor. I think, I think we spent f 11 days total, three or four of us actually went out in the field with the surveyor to help. Jeremy has the all-time record. If you've ever seen anything like special forces training, you would know what it's like to go out with Steve Ross, who's, what, 70 years old? And, and drove us all into the ground. Uh, so Jeremy worked with the surveyor. He helped clean up debris, hosted fundraisers, met with donors, worked with the land bond application committee, worked on a huge uh, Maine Natural Resources Conservation Grant, which we'll, he'll talk about later, did an envir coordinated environmental survey, did an ecological survey, a boundary survey, and many, many other things, probably 10,000 emails. And then on the 21st of December, when Jeremy was away, I went to the meeting, signed the papers, and got my picture in all the <laughs> newspapers around. So, so that was really, that was a great opportunity for me. Uh, but I, wanna, I want you to know that, that Jeremy spent hundreds of hours working on this project, 
and I got all the credit, which is, which is what I like to try to do if I can. Um, so, uh, I think I might have switched a page here. Oh, I know, I did, because I wanted to talk about that. Um, We we also did uh, we also did a number of other uh, other kinds of management things at the land trust. One of the one of the things we did was we've we've started doing stewardship as an all volunteer uh, subcommittee approach now um, to try to reduce the executive director's workload. Um, so we spent a lot of time this last year looking at our properties and and the stewardship. We have a really great stewardship subcommittee now um, and Mark Follinsby who wasn't here tonight was co-chair I'm I'm the co-chair but I would say that Diane Neal who's sitting over here raise your hand Diane um, she's she's thankfully kind of squeezing me out of that position which is terrific and we're going to be we're going to be we have plans and schedules for this summer and we'll be having more actual work days this year um, than we've had for a while to try to catch up on some of this stuff. So, you'll, if you if you'd like, we'd appreciate if you have an opportunity to help with some of these. And there'll be we have a list of, we have a list of stewardship volunteers that we'll be um, inviting to help at various times. So, so uh, you you may hear more about that if your name is on that list. And if you'd like to be on the list, talk to Kathy or one of the board members, and we'll see that you're on the list. Um, um, a lot of a lot of small projects, but it was it was a tremendously busy year. We had something going all the time, and and uh, uh, it felt really good. We've got a great we've got a great group of board members. We've got a great group of volunteers, and and Kathy has has picked up the slack in a lot of areas what we we needed to work on. Um, and we we couldn't do it all without your support. One of the one of the reasons to have our annual meeting is it is it is theoretically a business meeting, and through an unusual uh, through an unusual set of circumstance, uh, what we what we've decided is that the 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 board members the board members are supposed or excuse me the members of the land trust are supposed to vote vote in board members, and. We've decided that the the overhead of having an actual membership organization is pretty onerous, um, where you send out you know notices every year and people send in their money or don't, and you have to keep track of all that. So we've essentially decided that anyone who who has donated to the land trust in the last year is automatically a member of the land trust. So if you have donated to the land trust in the last year, you're you're a member and We'll, we will ask you in a couple of seconds uh, to vote for the board of directors. Um, we've talked about the various board of directors. Uh, I'm really thrilled that we have a, a new potential board of director, Betts Armstrong. Would you just raise your hand? Betts, is, Betts has been involved in, in all kinds of nonprofits in the Portland Scarborough area, um, Junior League, the, the uh, Maine Aquarium. Um, she's been tremendously involved with Wayne, Wayne Fleet School. She's done every position on the board at Wayne Fleet, including the president of the board, and, and we're really thrilled that, that she would like to be involved with the land trust. So uh, I'd like to uh, propose a vote. Uh, uh, all in favor of the slate of board members, uh, Betts, uh, Rick, Jeremy, myself, Patrick, Alex, Elizabeth, uh, uh, say aye, please. If you've if you've been a contributor, or raise your hand, that would be great. Aye. aye. And any opposed? None. That's great. Uh, anyone anyone have to abstain for any reason? That's great. I'm glad that I'm glad you didn't have to. Um, anyway, thank you thank you very much. And Bets, you're officially a board member, and and uh, you'll get your car and your keys. <laughs> Um, as soon as we can get those for you. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce Jeremy, who's the chair of the acquisitions committee, and he was the project leader for Warren Woods, and and he would like to, or we would like to have him just talk just a little bit about that that project and and 
get me off the microphone. So. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm just, uh, I have the, the uh, great task of um, getting to thank uh, three people um, for all their work on Warren Woods. But for those of you who aren't that familiar with the property, it's a project we've been working on, well, had been working on for probably four or five years off and on. And it's 156 acres, very close to Oak Hill, <coughs> and um, it's right along Payne Road. And it's got uh, trails on it, woods, non-such river frontage. And just for us to be able to protect 156 acres, essentially in the, right in the middle of town, is just uh, we're thrilled to, to have been able to do that. And it's a beautiful property. Um, you just walk in from Payne Road, and you walk in, and there are a number of fields and cleared areas. Um, so you've got really pretty, beautiful views. And then there's a network of trails. And there are other property owners nearby, whether it's Scarborough Downs or others that have um, all, all total between the, the Warren property and these other properties, that's a really big chunk of, of um, undeveloped land. So we're thrilled to have uh, been able to protect it. And the land trust, we're in the process right now of um, working on a stewardship plan for the property. So I would say to, to stay tuned for what our future plans and what, what the what our future plans are for the property. But essentially, we, we, we purchased it in partnership with the town um, for conservation land and for habitat and for public access. And so that, those are our overall goals. So we're just thrilled to have protected it and stay tuned um, as we develop stewardship plans for the property. Um, Boyle Associates is going to be talking a little later about the flora and fauna and habitat that's on the property. One of the things that drew, drew us to really work on this project is that there are a, a really unique, um, there's unique habitat there. There are really interested, interesting plant and animal species that are on the property. So um, you'll learn a little bit more about that uh, after, uh, after I get off here. <clears throat> the most important person to thank, obviously, is the landowner. And <clears throat> when I came on the land trust board in the early 90s, I served on the board with uh, Elaine Warren, who's, um, who is uh, Harvey Warren's uh, former wife, and got to know her. She's a really nice, she was a really nice person, really enjoyed working with her. And for me, it's just really nice to know um, how this has all come full circle and to know that we're going to be officially renaming the property Elaine Stimson Warren Woods. And so just having worked with Elaine and knowing her and knowing the family, it's, um, we are just uh, really pleased to be able to see this all come together. And uh, we can't wait to officially rename the property Elaine Stimson Warren Woods on June 1st. We're going to have, be having a property dedication and a tour of the property and a walk. So that's when we will be, when we'll be doing that. Throughout the course of this project, I uh, came to learn how much Harvey Warren loves his property. He knows the property inside and out, um, and he really loves his property and cares deeply about it. Um, just, I learned a lot, of, a lot about the property through his family members, and <clears throat> really pleased to present Harvey Warren with a photo of the property. It's basically a collage. But on behalf of the Land Trust, we'd like to thank the most important person in this project and the person who made it happen, Harvey Warren. Another important person in this project um, is sitting to the right of Harvey. Um, it's a person I've, uh, throughout the course of the project, uh, came, I came to memorize her cell phone, her work phone, or her home phone, her home email address, her work email address, any other contact information that she had, I, I came to memorize it. But um, Becky Seal, Harvey's daughter, uh, did an incredible amount of work in this project. Um, that we probably started this project maybe 
four or five years ago, people who were on the land, who are no longer on the land trust board started it. Um, I got involved, I started working on it with Dan Warren, uh, Becky's, Becky's brother, and then I started working on it with Becky. And as many of these things um, happen, there are a lot of ups and downs and hurdles and challenges, and throughout it, Becky was just a really a pleasure to work with. She, um, she uh, is a straight shooter and always kept us moving forward anytime we had a bump, anytime we had a problem, and so it was just a real pleasure to work with her on it. Becky's a founding member of the land, founding director of the Land Trust, so she and her family have a long history uh, with the Land Trust. So, on behalf of the Land Trust, I want to say thank you very much, Becky. Um, project could not have happened without you. So, thank you. And since we're in a his building, I have to also thank um, Tom Hall and the town of Scarborough. Uh, the town, is, uh, the town was, the, was the biggest funder of the Warren Woods uh, project, um, and we could not have done the project without the support of, of Tom Hall and others at Town Hall. <coughs> um, the town funded the, the project through the land bond, and for those of you who don't know, Scarborough voters have passed three different land bonds over the last probably eight, nine years. There is no other town in Maine that's done that. And it just speaks to the citizens' value and their importance on land protection and land conservation. Um, even though Scarborough has developed really rapidly over the last 25, 30 years, Scarborough voters have essentially said it's worth a little bit of extra tax in order to have these properties protected and always have them available for public access. In a way, I think of um, the, some of the properties that the land bond and the town council has supported. They include the Jarvis property in the marsh, Broadturn Farm, Warren Woods, um, and Fuller Farm. Those are just some of the properties that have been protected by the um, that have been. Those are some of the properties that have been protected with help from the town. <clears throat> and you know, I think of it as part of Scarborough's history, part of Scarborough's heritage. They're much like bricks and mortar, much like a hospital, a school, a church. These are all ways where, you know, the part of Scarborough will always be there. So having the land bond and folks at Town Hall ready to partner with the land trust is, has been a huge help. And I just want to thank Tom Hall and the town manager's office. Um, every, basically everybody at Town Hall has really been uh, helpful to the land trust in doing these projects, whether it's um, Public Works, Planning Department, um, GIS. Um, GIS Department made the maps that we use for our fundraising and they really help with planning. Um, assessing Department, the Land Bond Board, and also the Town Council. So it's just great to know that when, when uh, the Land Trust and the Town and others partner together, we can really, really do good things. And Tom has been great to work with. Uh, we made the application of the land bond. He helped us through that process. And then we made the presentation of the town council. He helped us through that process. And some of you may have seen different photos around town hall, but we, um, we have, a, we have a one here for Tom to add to the collection. And uh, we hope that there will be many more, to, many more of them to come. But I just want to say thank you to Tom Hall and to everybody at, um, uh, in the town of Scarborough. Thank you very much. It's, it's awkward for me to be receiving this. Certainly, it's, it's not my money, it's, it's, and it's part of my job to do this. Um, but I'm really here and I'm pleased to accept this on behalf of the town council and, and uh, all the citizenry. It's all made possible, obviously, through uh, the overwhelming support. Uh, as Jeremy mentions, three times we've gone to the voters. And I think uh, in uh, none of those times was it less than 60% of voters approved, which is just remarkable. And so. Myself and the, and the other folks here at Town Hall are certainly pleased to be part of the process. And whatever little I can do to prepare things and make sure they go smoothly before council, I'm certainly pleased to do. So thank you very much. So I'm supposed to give this mic back to Paul, right? Okay. Leave it on. We have a lot of
of secret things going on here tonight. Ah, uh, here we go. Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy had no idea this was happening. He's he's a very modest member, the modest member of the land trust board. Come up here, step up here. Jeremy, the all I can say is thank you very much for your your leadership on Warren Woods. This says Jeremy Winterstein, with appreciation for your extraordinary leadership in the conservation of the Elaine Stimson Warren Woods Scarborough Land Trust, March 14, 2013. And and all I can say is that we would have a really hard time to do what we do without Jeremy Winterstein. Thank you very much. Let's see, another Christmas present. Bert Fallensby. Is Bert? Come here. <laughs> Bert, well, when we got Mark on the land trust board, we got Bert. <laughs> it's the way it works, CD, just in case you didn't know. Um, this, Bert is a professional graphic designer, and she designed our new our new Land Trust logo, which I'm sure you've seen. I hope you've seen. It's on everything we do now. Um, it was a, a committee project, and we all know how committee projects work. Uh, but Bert showed incredible perseverance, and, and we really appreciate your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's see, and we, we had a we have a longtime supporter named Royce O'Donnell, who I'm sure most of you most of you know. Um, Royce has been very, very supportive of of Broad Turn Farm and helping John and Stacy and so on. And Royce wasn't able to attend the meeting tonight. Um, he has he has done all kinds of things for the land trust. If we need some rough lumber for a project, all you have to do is call Royce and he'll saw it. He has a little sawmill. And one of the things he's done for us, uh, and Royce is in his 80s, John, probably. Um, one of the things he did for us recently is he built a beautiful bench that's on the trail, uh, the extended trail from Sewell Woods that goes to Frith Farm. And we wanted to make a plaque for Royce. So we made a brass plaque to put on that bench. And as soon as we told him we like that bench, he asked if he could make another one. And we're going, we've asked him to make one for Fuller Farm. But we had a plaque made that says that we'll put on the bench that says built and donated by Royce O'Donnell, generous friend and supporter of the Scarborough Land Trust. So he couldn't be here tonight, but we wanted to, to mention him. So. Uh, that one's yours. Now, this says to Rita Breton, with appreciation for your leadership, generosity, and dedication to our mission. Rita? Did Rita? Where is Rita? Come up here, Rita. Rita is, is our most active board member who isn't on the board. <laughs> About 10 seconds after the Broad Turn Farm dinner last year, this was before the people had even left, when we figured we were going to have to take Rita to Maine Medical Center, she said, you know, I think I want to do this again next year. <laughs> and we were just stunned. So, Rita, I want to give this to you and, and this to you and Rudy. So, and have a nice trip to Florida tomorrow. Rita is, has done the Broad Turn Farm Dinner. She's very involved with the Development and Communications Committee. Uh, doing editing, helping all kinds of things. Um, she has revamped what will be our table at the farmer's market, which is mostly set up there except for the tent. Um, she's just done a hundred things to help out the land trust in all kinds of communications and development capacity. And we just, she's just a wonderful volunteer and a great person to work with. So thank you very much. Have, have bon voyage. She's going to Florida tomorrow and leaving us here, stuck with all this. So I think I've done all the damage that I can do tonight. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Kathy, who's going to introduce the speakers. And this is Kathy Mills, our new executive director. Thank you.
It's really great to um, stop in the middle of a full tilt year and talk about volunteers and supporters and the work that we've done because Scarborough Land Trust is one of uh, over 100 land trusts in the state of Maine. And land trusts simply could not do what they're doing, which is so important, the work that we're doing, um, without volunteers and supporters. Um, so you're it. You're, you are part of what is making this happen. Um, we need you. We value you. If you know more fo folks who care about um, conservation and natural resources and open space, draw them into our work because we need them. Um, our communities need them, and you will want them to participate to help us all move the dial forward. Um, in, in acquiring land, there's all sorts of pr things that need to be done. Um, um, environmental assessments for hazards on the property and ecological assessments for natural resources and boundary surveys. Jeremy could recite them in his sleep because he's been through them all a, a jillion times. Um, Boyle and Associates were the um, professionals that conducted the ecological assessment of Warren Woods for us. And so two of their scientists, at least two if not more, um, roamed around the property this summer looking at everything. Um, soil, water, plants, habitat, um, the river, um, all sorts of things. And they produced uh, an ecological assessment report that's part of the requirements that we have for acquiring a property. And it's a copy of it is up back. Anyway, when they finished their work, one of their staff said, you know, we were really blown away by what we found on the Warren property. So we thought, okay, it's time to get this information out of the binders of this report and share it with the people here in town who have helped us um, acquire this property. So it's my pleasure to introduce, without further ado, um, Rich Jordan, who is actually a Scarborough native and holds the record for the triple jump from Scarborough High School. <laughs> and, and, um, and Ross, Steve, Steve, Steve Ross. Coach Ross. Coach Ross who did the boundary survey for the project. I mean, Jeremy mentioned how all these strands are tying up. It's not just the family. It's also natives and coaches. Everybody's involved in this Warren project. So um, Rich is a uh, wetland scientist, and he and Kelsey Kaufman, who's a botanist, um, were the two who roamed the property and learned all the good stuff, and they're going to take it away for you tonight. Thank you for coming. Hello. Um, I had uh, three warnings, I think. The first one, uh, we had two warnings that Kathy gave us. One, Rich, speak slowly, and Kelsey, speak loudly. And three, you have 20 minutes, and then I'm yanking you off. So <laughs> if you see Kathy start waving her arms frantically, we've run over. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we're happy to be here. This was a great project. Uh, I do environmental consulting for developers primarily, um, as your state senator Jim Boyle, my boss here, can tell you, you know, we've been interested in Warren Woods just from a sort of aerial photo search for cool properties for a long time. So when this project came along, thank you, when this project came along, we, you know, I saw in the, the newspaper article, I think it was Paul and Kathy or Jack and Kathy eating cranberries in the field, and I said, wow, we gotta, we gotta be a part of that. That's a cool project. So um, we're happy to be here. We're glad we got to be a part. So. Without further ado, um, this, the presentation tonight we put together and uh, in, in an effort to bring it down to 20 minutes-ish, um, we've removed some slides within the last 45 minutes, so I may jump around a bit. Um, uh, first, I'm going to go through where the site is for those who aren't familiar with it. We have a few maps to uh, sort of locate yourself on the earth and, and within Scarborough. I want to talk a little bit about watersheds, what they are, what, what watershed this property is in. Um, and then uh, why that's important is because it's in the Nonsuch River watershed, which anybody familiar with the land trust and certainly the town's efforts over the last 20 years knows the Nonsuch is an important resource. So we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, and then we'll sort of zoom out some aerial photos of the property and then zoom back in to show you what's there. Uh, we'll talk about the wetlands that we found, the types of habitats. Um, Kelsey's going to do a talk about uh, the really cool and unique plants that, um, that inhabit the site. There's um, some really nice stuff out there. We've got some great photos to go through, a lot of really cool animal photos. Um, and then we'll have a question session and hopefully provide answers to those questions. I don't want to be presumptuous. Uh, so this is the property, the, um, if I can 
get this to work. The black line is the town of Scarborough. The red is the Warren Woods property. This is the Turnpike and Payne Road. Um, and one thing I'll talk about a lot in my little discussion here up front is the Nunsuch River. This blue line is the Nunsuch. And as you can see, most of its stretch, most of its reach runs through the town of Scarborough from its origins over here at the Saco Heath. <coughs> I'm getting there, Kathy. <laughs> yes. Um, well, the, again, the nut such is important for numerous reasons. Um, of course, you know, one being it's the largest source of fresh water to the Scarborough Marsh. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me go back here. So uh, before I get into the next slide, which shows you where the boundaries of the different watersheds in the town are, I'll talk a little bit about what a watershed is. Um, it's basically, it's, the, it's a depression in the earth. It's, it's the area within all surface and subsurface flow ends up in the same water body. So um, uh, to put it a little more poetically, John Wesley Powell, the famed explorer of the Southwest, um, who's also a professional geographer, he said that a watershed is that area of land, a bounded hydrologic system within which all living things are inextricably linked by their common water course, and where, as humans settled, simple logic demanded that we become part of a community. Um, so I knew Kathy would like that community aspect tie-in. Um, but it's a great explanation. Basically, everything that happens in the watershed stays in the watershed. <clears throat> uh, this depicts the major watersheds in the town. And again, this blue area is the outline, is the watershed of the Nunsuch River. It takes up about two-thirds of the town of Scarborough, and, and most of it is within the town. Again, the Saco Heath takes up a large piece of it over here. Um, other watersheds in the town, of course, the Scarborough River, which makes up the main course of the Scarborough Marsh down here. Um, that's fed by other smaller water bodies, like the Libby River, Millbrook, Dunstan River. Um, and again, how all these work is, uh, you know, somebody washes their car here, that runs off into the road ditch, the road ditch runs into a wetland, the wetland runs into a stream, the stream runs into a larger stream, that larger stream runs into Dunstan River, that runs into Scarborough River, the Scarborough River runs into Saco Bay. <laughs> so that's how it all sort of works. And um, the, other, the other watersheds within the town, Spurwink River, the Spurwink River is actually the eastern boundary of the town here along Cape, uh, the Four River. Um, which again, these are large, these are the larger watershed boundaries within the Four River. You first drain into Red Brook, which drains into Long Creek, which then goes into the Four River. Um, Stroud water up here, mostly in Gorham, but a piece of it runs through Scarborough. And then uh, Millbrook, and uh, this is a different Millbrook, I believe, than the one that runs into the Scarborough Marsh, yes. So this is the Millbrook that makes up the Old Orchard Marshes. And then, of course, everything along the coast here is, runs into the bay directly. So given its size, given um, that it takes up a lot of the town of Scarborough, uh, the town and the land trust have spent many years focused somewhat, um, you know, as part of many focuses, on uh, protecting lands along the Nunsuch River. This is the general course of the river through here. As you can see, there are a lot of properties along the river that have been protected either by the town, the state, or the land trust. Um, and just add, most recently, I drew in the Cumstock property here just a couple days ago. But um, we were back Fuller Farm and Broad Turn Farm. Um, this is the Warren property here. And again, as you look down the river, um, you know, you're looking at areas that aren't currently preserved or protected. And when you find one that the land trust could potentially, you know, put an easement on, it's a big deal. It's something that everybody jumps on. So uh, to sort of show you where we are, in case you're not really sure, this is, this is eight corners. This red line is the approximate property outline of, of the Warren property. Uh, Payne Road again, and Gorham Road in the back, Scarborough Downs to the south. <clears throat> this map uh, basically uses the, uh, the main outline of the property. As everybody said, it's primarily forested land um, with the Nunsuch up top here in the north. These areas uh, were created by uh, Mr. Warren back in the um, several decades ago uh, as part of creation of a golf course. And there was also an a ultralight landing strip here for, for a small personal aircraft. Um, now he's done a lot of work out here, and I'm really hoping that uh, he'll make it to the June, uh, make it out to the June walkthrough, because I'd love to hear the personal history of the property, and um, hopefully uh, we have a lot of theory as to what's going on out here. And um, if I'm wrong, I'm sure he'll let me know. <clears throat> These are this is a fairly accurate, I think, depiction of the wetlands on the property. 
Um, there are a bunch of types of wetlands. Kelsey's going to talk a little more about the different types of habitats we found. But uh, this indicates all the different stream areas, all the runoff that comes out of the large forested wetlands and the fields. Um, and again, up here is uh, the Scotto bog, which is really, a really nice feature we'll talk a lot about. Um, again, these are the types of habitats. This is different areas on the property, which Kelsey will expound a bit on. Um, oops. Jump ahead. So the important thing, um, one kind of cool thing here is to look at the different terraces or steps upon the property. That they're really made up of, of historic floodplains going back 10 or 12,000 years to the last ice age. But the current floodplain and such is, is relegated to this area, you know, right along the same elevation as the river. And uh, stepping up out of there, you, you go up about 8 or 12 feet until you hit this large area where there's really not a lot of topographic change. This appears to be uh, the former boundary of the river back when it was a much larger system. Um, so anywhere in this area, you have a lot of really fine grained soil. So anywhere water sits, uh, wetlands form. So this is a fairly wet stretch in through here. Um, and then as you walk in sort of south through the woods at any point, this yellow line roughly indicates about a 20 foot uh, topo change. It's a, it's a increase in the land elevation. So it's kind of cool and it happens fast. You walk through here and all of a sudden it looks like somebody's excavated a wall or filled a wall in the middle of the forest and it's just a vegetated and really steep jump and you uh, walk up on top of that and you enter this large sort of sandy plain which encompasses Scarborough Downs and Haggis Parkway and extends all the way to Scotto Hill to the south. Um, and this area is more sandy so you have a few less wetlands but the wetlands you have are really really cool. They include Scotto Bog which again we'll talk about. Um, now I'm going to let Kelsey talk a little bit about the habitats and plants and animals. Thanks, Rich. Um, so now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and show you some photos and kind of give you a virtual tour of some of the highlights from my field work last summer. Um, we had a really fun time walking around out there, crashing through the woods and slopping through the wetlands and um, getting bit by mosquitoes and exploring. It was, it was fabulous. Um, so I'd like to start here at the Nunsuch River and then work, work our way south until we end up up on the terrace at Scotto Bog. This is sort of a typical view of the river in this area. Um, you have nice trees with overhanging branches and vegetated banks. Um, a few uh, dead limbs and trees in the water providing habitat for fish and turtles. Um, and also some interesting plants. Um, does anybody, I've, okay, so I've included the scientific names here, but I'll use the common names. Does anybody know the common name for this one? Anybody have a guess? Cardinal flower. You didn't even need my hint. Okay. <laughs> um, so, as you turn and walk away from the river, you cross a big flat floodplain, the first floodplain you come to. And here, um, you'll see a lot of multi-stemmed red maple trees. They like to grow in wet floodplain areas. And along here, there's also sort of really thick, lush, maybe waist-high vegetation of grasses and sedges, a few shrubs, um, not, nothing too thick. Um, and this is sort of a typical scene from the floodplain and other wetlands on the property. Um, the trees here, when they grow in a wet area, the roots don't grow down. They kind of spread out along the ground so that they have access to oxygen. Um, they can't be totally inundated. And so when the wind blows, this tends to happen. It's fun to climb over. Now, as you <laughs> walk up out of the floodplain, you come into some of these clearings. Um, this is one of the fields. And um, you can really tell sort of how wet the fields are by the vegetation that's growing here. So this is one of the drier fields. And you'll see in the front a really thick mat of low bush blueberry and um, a little denser patch of bayberry. They kind of grow in these island thickets like that. Um, and bayberry, you can tell because the, the leaves and the twigs are really fragrant when you, when you crush them. Um, here's kind of an example of one of the wetter areas. This is along the back edge of the airstrip um, where the drainage ditches are kind of overflowing now and um, providing a really interesting bog habitat. So this is coming in pretty much as a peat bog. Um, and is characterized pretty much by sphagnum moss. Now, sphagnum moss likes to grow in 
really wet and acidic areas, and it has the ability to create even more acidic conditions. And um, once it moves in, there's a whole group of species that, that thrive in that acidic condition. So they're pretty much only found in bogs. Um, this one, sheep laurel, also can <laughs> live both in acidic bog conditions and in really dry places. And so that one you'll find throughout the meadows. Um, bogs are also really low in nutrients. This is a sundew plant. They're only about three or four inches high. And they get their nutrients by eating insects. They're one of the few carnivorous plants in Maine. Um, the sticky glandular hairs on the leaves will attract the insects and then trap them. By sticking to them, the leaves can sense touch or will curl over the insect. And then they excrete enzymes and will digest the bugs and, and absorb the nutrients. Here are a couple more species that live in the wet areas. The bog spike moss on the right and cotton grass on the left. And a field full of cotton grass is really beautiful <laughs> in the fall. I see Becky nodding her head. <laughs> These are a couple of the bog orchids. These are bog adapted species. Um, grass pink on the left and rose pagonia on the right. Um, these, these species pretty much only grow in, in bog conditions. And I would we do there aren't too many places in Scarborough where you can go and see a lot of these things all in one place. Um, does anybody know this flower? <laughs> This is White flower. Yeah, this is a cranberry flower. So these guys are only about the size of a cranberry, maybe half an inch long. Um, and you can see the leaves on the left there, these um, oval-shaped leaves here. Now, these fields are full of cranberries. It's amazing. When in the late summer, when you're walking around, it's hard not to like step and not feel them pop beneath your feet. It's really, <laughs> really they're, they're quite abundant. And this little guy is a bog copper butterfly, and they're pretty much dependent on cranberries for just about every part of their life cycle. The adults will drink the nectar from the flowers, lay their eggs on the cranberry leaves, they overwinter in the egg form, and then in the spring, the caterpillars hatch out and feed exclusively on cranberry plants. Um, now, these guys don't move around much. They pretty much spend their whole life cycle. One population will stay pretty much in one wetland. So. I would guess that, that just by the presence of this relationship, they've, cranberries and these butterflies have been around for quite a while. And this really speaks to the integrity and the value of, of this land. It's really, really neat to discover this out there. So if you keep walking south between all the, the clearings and then up until you get to the terrace, the large terrace, you walk through a large forest of wetland. And um, you can't really tell from this picture, but it's pretty hard walking, especially later in the summer. <laughs> the cinnamon ferns in this picture will get up to like chest high. And then if you can push those out of the way, you still have to kick through all the skunk cabbage leaves. And then you're tripping over all the raised roots, so trying not to fall in <laughs> like little muddy wet pits. and being devoured by mosquitoes, it's just, it's awesome. It's really, <laughs> it's really great. And um, <laughs> this, yeah, beats office work, no doubt. Um, so this time of year, um, skunk cabbage is actually probably just about flowering on the property. It's one of the earliest flowering plants out there. Um, and these flowers have the unique ability, well, pretty unique, of actually making heat, generating heat, and they will melt their way up through the snow. Um, so you'll see these little melted rings around a red flower. They're also unique in that the, the flowers attract early emerging flies and other pollinators by smelling like rotten meat. So they don't, <laughs> they don't eat the bugs, but <laughs> they, they're not a typical, it's not the typical way of finding pollinators. Um, and as you make it out of that wetland, the ground smooths out, the roots go underground. You see more upland species like bunchberry, um, some red oak seedlings, other ferns. 
and the trees change as well. As you're climbing up, there's kind of a north-facing slope, and so there are a couple really nice groves of hemlocks and tall white pines. And if you're lucky enough to make it this far, um, some beautiful pink lady slipper orchids in there too. So if once you're up on the terrace and keep going and maybe head a little bit east, you get to Scotto Bog. And Scotto Bog is a pitch pine uh, bog community here, which is a pretty rare natural community in Maine. One of the best examples of it is at the Saco Heath, which is the headwaters of the Nonsuch River, so not too far away. But um, all the same, it's great to preserve more of it. And at this location, it's sort of characterized by an open canopy of mostly pitch pine, um, really thick, tall shrubs, and then sort of um, these little openings with peat moss. They're usually pretty squishy with thick cranberries, like in this photo. And here's one of the tall shrubs, Rhodora, that, that flowers in probably about June. It's really pretty to walk through there. And there's me just for scale, standing up in Scotto Bog. I'm going to let Rich talk about soils. Um, yeah, I'll try to make it somewhat quick, but it's pretty fascinating. Um, this uh, this core, this is a this is a, a this is an excavation. There, a little soil core um, using a Dutch auger from from within Scotto Bog, and uh, this is from uh, the forested wetland upslope of Scotto Bog, up on the same terrace. A um, couple things. This, it looks like a bottomless bog, but you can walk through there with, with knee-high boots and you won't go over the boot. Um, you hit a hard pan sand, you hit, this, you hit this layer of sand that's cemented and compact, and that's what holds up all the water in the bog. So what's kind of cool about it when I call this soil, it's, it's really peat. There's not, there's not a mineral material in this whole core. This is all successive layers of decomposing and built up uh, organic matter. It's basically sphagnum, sphagnum moss. Um, so the moss on top grows on the previous year's moss, which grows, you know, which kind of uh, decomposes under it to uh, various states of decomposition until you hit this layer where, where basically nothing's moving. It's just the hard sand. So all the water that comes in this bog comes primarily from rainwater and snowmelt. That water floods the system. The system has no oxygen and nothing decomposes. So the organic matter just builds and builds and builds and builds over thousands of years um, to where we are now. Uh, if you look at the other soil sample, you can notice this is a sort of a loamy sand on the bottom, this is sand, and then the organic matter is only about four or five inches thick. Again, indicating that the water in this area does not stay to the surface year round, so you actually get some decomposition and you have much less, much less organic. And um, you also don't have that hard pan sand, which is holding up the water. In this case, the, whatever's holding the water up is way down here. Um, Hopefully that makes sense. It's really, it's a really interesting site, and again, hopefully everybody gets a chance to ch check it out and at least poke your head into the bog um, with a mosquito net on. Uh, I'll jump into a discussion of wildlife. We found a moose skull um, somewhere in the forest at Wetland, sort of needle in a haystack. Stumbled over it. It was upside down, and I saw teeth, you know, from a thousand yards. I was like, whoa, what is that? Um, so indicating, obviously, at some point, you know. There were moose traversing the area. Um, I'm sure they still do, they still come through large mammals, tons of deer. Um, it's uh, one of the cool things I've neglected to mention about the importance of the Nunsuch is the the wildlife corridor aspect. The fact that it is fairly undeveloped, moose, deer, bobcat, fox, raccoons, um, coyotes. They all make their way along the river from property to property, from open space to open space, and they need these corridors. So. Uh, when you find things like whoops, you find things like moose, um, you know that they're probably not living at Warren Woods, but they're certainly using it for food and, and uh, different times of the year. Um, we did set up a game camera um, in several locations, and uh, we we had it up for maybe 20 days total, maybe 25 days total, and um, we just had I think we got photos of probably 30 different species, um, counting birds and mammals, and just to kind of quickly rip through what we pulled off yesterday, um, we had. Blue, the black and white photos are either nighttime or early morning, so they're flash photos. But uh, had a blue jay uh, used to hang out in front of the camera. We had about 50 pictures of him. <laughs> um, this doe came into view for about two hours one day. I got a lot of photos of her. Um, had a few porcupines at night walk by. Uh, the more I look at this, the less I'm sure, but I'm calling this a bobcat. Um, 
I kind of think that may be a tail, but I'm hoping it's not just a big tomcat. Uh, but this was, we, we set this camera up primarily thinking um, we we're going to look for a New England cottontail. We wanted to check that, check out the opportunities out there for that. And so we went into really thick areas. Um, I know Kelly Bowen's going, Psh, call that thick? That's not very thick. <laughs> but uh, no, we, uh, so, you know, some of these areas were really, really thick, dense shrubs. So I, I guess I would say I'd be surprised if it's a cat, but it could be a cat. But I'm going to call it a bobcat because I want to. Um, we had uh, several species of ground nesting thrushes. This is, a, I think, a hermit thrush, and we had veery wood thrush and um, oven bird all showed up in our camera at certain times. Uh, possum, raccoon. Um, this, uh, this is a robin. This, this was a cool little mystery we solved yesterday. Well, I think we solved it. Um, we looked at it, and we were like, oh, and Kelsey's thinking kestrel. And I'm like, I don't know. What do you, maybe just a weird blue jay shot. And then we realized, like, look at that super stiff tail. That's a woodpecker. So then we sort of, once we got to that point, we said, that's, that's probably a northern flicker. Um, ground sort of woodpeckers are like hanging out in the ground. Um, a lot of pictures of a red squirrel as well. Our first camera site, I probably saw him about 90 times. <laughs> Uh, but what's cool is we also saw this guy. Uh, I got two or three photos of him running through. This is a, a short-tailed weasel, also known as an ermine, and uh, they will eat red squirrels. So I'm thinking he may have been chasing down our, our, um, our uh, the guy who was hanging out too long in front of my camera. Um, we also have seen, we saw coyotes one day, and Kelsey went out about a week and a half ago and took some photos while we still had snow, and there's some coyote tracks through the field. Um, some more photos. This is one of the drainage areas through the through the wet, uh, coming out of one of the wetlands. Um, this is uh, some of the growth in the fields is coming up as shrubs. This is back when we had our short period of winter. If you re remember, we had some snow. Um, and this these are some pines are probably six feet tall, so we had a good good slug of snow back then. <clears throat> um, so, sort of wrap it up. Um, it's an important piece of land. Um, really excited to have worked on it. We're glad it came to fruition. I think um, it's a great deal for the town. It's, a, it's an awesome uh, centerpiece for the land trust. Everybody should be really proud it came together. Um, it's important for a lot of reasons, one of which is the corridors, uh, the wildlife corridors, but also it's important from an aesthetics and a, an education aspect. Um, just as we sort of barely touched upon the cool aspects of this site, there's this unlimited opportunities for education out here. Um, getting people, yeah, getting kids into nature and just showing them, you know, touch a cotton grass, or touch the top of cotton grass. It feels like a rabbit's foot. I mean, it's just super cool. And then there's a lot of things out there to sort of touch and smell and feel and sound and hear. And, um, yeah, another uh, aspect of this which blew our minds was it's, it's been, you know, it's been cut a long time ago. It's been mowed. It's been maintained. It's, the mall is up here. This is 95. There's all kinds of development. There's very few invasive species. So we're really, really surprised. It is not, we're not finding fields of purple loose strife. We're not finding, you know, Phragmites or common reed. We're not, just not, just not a lot of invasives out there. Um, that's, you know, they're there, but they're not taken over. So, I mean, it is something that's going to be worked into, that has to be worked into the long-term management of the site, is making sure that that's, that low level of invasive takeover is maintained. But um, as it is now, it's just pretty impressive to have property this big in this area that, that's really not, that hasn't been taken over. And then, you know, finally, it's a great site because, you know, the corridors to and from other sites are important, but it's 156 acres of varied habitat. I mean, it itself provides a lot of lifetime habitat for a lot of different animals and a lot of different bugs. Um, there's also, there are several streams, there's opportunities for fish, and we found several, uh, several ponds, open water, uh, ephemeral ponds, vernal pools that provide habitat for frogs and salamanders, potentially turtles. Um, small mammals and birds. I mean, it's just a, it's a great site, and again, you know, we're happy to have worked on it. Any questions? Paul? Oh. In, the, in the peat core that you took, um, in the peat core that you took, can you guess how many years that represented? I could guess, but I'd probably be wrong. I mean, uh, you know, uh, well, the I mean, we were under ocean, say, 8,000 years ago, so maybe somewhere within the last 8 to 10,000 years, maybe. And that, and that, what the have for? Well, the other thing about Scotto Bog is it's a bog, and a bog is an area that only receives atmospheric precipitation, meaning there's no stream, there's no other source of water other than rain and snow melt. So there are times of the year when it dries enough that decomposition happens. So unlike a bog that will stay wet to the surface year-round, you'll get the six feet of peat moss. You know, this, uh, this bog probably dries up enough so that some of that 
gets turned over every year. So. But we know the, yeah, we know the bog has been there for quite a while because it's listed or it's drawn on early topographic maps also as a big wetland. Scotto bog used to be a lot bigger. I mean, it's just with development and things like that, it's, it's shrunk over the years. Yeah, we found we went we pulled up topographic maps going back to 1890. Um, it doesn't show up on the 1890 map, uh, but there are several drainages that no longer exist or have been altered by the Turnpike and Scarborough Downs, uh, both built in the early 50s. Um, we then have a 19, I'm not sure when, somewhere in the 50s topographic map that does show Scotto Bog, and it shows it from 114 to Payne Road. Um, it's a huge feature all of it draining south to Mill Brook. And that, that map actually looks like it was fairly, well, way more accurate than the 1890s map, as you would expect. Um, moving to, what do you 1960, what's the next one? 70, 1960, 1970 topo map. Um, everything's very similar to how it is now, so it, except that it shows the bog is half of what it was in 1890 or 1950 topo and it now has drainages both to the north and to the south. Um, but so, guessing the 1950 map was accurate, it was twice its size. Assuming it wasn't fully accurate, it's a bit smaller than it was. So, no, but certainly drainage has changed a lot. Yeah. Drainage has changed and there's some floristic clues there too. So pitch pine is found in the bog and it's also found um, sort of towards Scarborough Downs, a little bit beyond the current day boundaries of the bog. Um, this plant can grow wetlands and uplands, so that's not saying everything, but um, that combined with the maps and some of what the clues we know about the land use history around there um, make us think that it used to be a lot bigger. It'd be a really interesting question for somebody to pursue, maybe core some trees, um, dig around a little bit. It could be really fun. Yeah. What did you find the most uh, surprising about the property? Stuff that you I went into the project with few expectations, but I I really was amazed at the at the peat bog parts of it and the bog plants that were growing up in areas that had been pretty recently disturbed by clearing and bulldozing and mowing and they just came right back up. So that was really fun for me to see. Um, I don't know, Rich? Oh, and the lack of invasive species. Like, you guys are in a totally enviable position right now. You could totally just get rid of them. So <laughs> that's, that's a good place to be. Yeah, I think I think the the bog-like aspects of the fields, because when you walk onto the field and you see these large expanses of mowed areas, and then you get up closer and realize that it's um, you know lowbush blueberry and cranberry and orchids and um, um, America uh, bayberry, um, you know plants you generally I don't see in fairways, you know, so it's a, it's a unique site, and I mean. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I brought, we have a soil scientist that works for us that I brought out there and we spent like four or five hours just digging holes all, you know, it's running around digging holes. I mean, the history is amazing. I mean, it's been, some of it's been altered and ditched and drained and scraped and filled and stuff's been moved around and um, it's just a cool site to sort of analyze from, from that standpoint. But at the same time, you walk out of any of these woods and look across the fields, it's just like, Wow, I didn't, I didn't really expect this. And, and then to reiterate what, what Kelsey said, my first thought was this was all going to be Russian olive or autumn olive, and this was all going to be, you know, um, you know, honeysuckle. It's not. You know, it's all, it's all native plants. So. Yes. So I think I think both. I think it's, it's sort of the, it's sort of the succession from mode like in an upland field, typical farm field. They mow it and they leave it, and 40 years later it's a forest, or about 100 years later it's a forest. You go through all those intermediate steps. Um, this site, the hydrology and the soils are kind of fun and interesting. So there are areas that we think are coming back to peat bog. I mean, they're just they're wet enough, and the the, the uh, seed base is there and the soil base is there. They're coming back, low growth, um, you know, ericaceous like. like 
blueberry and the calmia and all the, all, all the, the bog plants that Kelsey was talking about. Um, other areas are coming up with white pine. The really dry areas are coming up. Um, they'll be forested. I think a lot of areas are, are really thick with that bayberry, um, and those will more than likely stay as shrub habitats, at least for the foreseeable decades. Um, and, uh, you know, all those habitats in amongst themselves provide, like, great habitat for different, you know, different types of animals, rabbits and small mammals and birds. That, um, it's hard to say. I mean, t we'd, we'd definitely be guessing what it's going to look like in 100 years. I'm sure it'll be different, but aspects of it will probably be exactly the same. So. Well, snowshoes would be great, <laughs> I think, or cross-country skis in the winter. It's a, it's pretty flat most of it. It'd be fun to ski around in those fields. Um, as it is, you probably need some rubber boots in the summer, and if you really want to get to see a lot of it, um, there are a few small r roads and trails between the clearings you can walk around on. Any other questions or? <laughs> and the reason I ask is when people think about mock, they think, ew, you know, I'm going to get wet and it's mucky and it's, you know, it's, it's people have mosquitoes and people have mock. <laughs> just just for diversity really and because they're wetlands is another reason wetlands perform a lot of functions here um rich well i mean the the tech the technical answer is well they hold a lot of storm water that would otherwise cause potential downstream flooding um but I, it, it's similar to why we protect showy lady slippers, you know, because they're amazing and they, you know, and uh, there's a lot to learn from them and potentially, uh, 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 you know, a lot to be gained just by looking at them. So, I mean, there is a sort of touchy-feely aspect to why should we protect bogs, I mean, there's, but certainly, um, you know, an area like this where, uh, I don't know what the extent of the bog, maybe 50 acres, um, you know, everything that falls in that 50 acres stays on that 50 acres until it evaporates. So. Um, so it's holding a lot. Of, it's holding a lot of moisture, but it also provides a ton of habitat for species. Um, and I, uh, I, don't know. Well, I would add too that one of the things about. Sorry, I'm Jim Boyle. That uh, they work for me. One, one of the key things about bogs is that uh, <laughs> with me. Um, well, it, <laughs> thanks. A big factor is the less you, we humans have of something, the more we value of it, value it. So it's the rarity of a bog itself that, that adds to its value for us as people, I think. And I, while I have the mic, one of the things that, uh, that nobody's touched on that I think is crucial, I'd like people to understand about this, and Paul touched on a little bit, is um, we've been working on, we work on projects all over, and we recognize, as Rich said, we're very excited. But what some of the proof of that was this main natural resources conservation program. This project was submitted along with about a dozen others to the state for that program and received funding. It was the top rank that got everything it asked for, which is fairly unusual. And, and I've been working on those since that program was accepted, it, it started, and have been at meetings that address them all over the state. They, it's a very detailed matrix system for scoring. And this, this was a slam dunk, top of the heap no questions kind of asked. So not just, you've been talking about Scarborough, which is great, and that's your focus, but regionally this is a very important parcel. And what you've done here is regionally the top of what was proposed for the year, and also in my view, having been around a lot of them, the top for, you know, three or four years at least in this region for its size.
Well, I think the clearings came at a time when Scott Obog was starting to fill in, and so you were losing the open habitat that a lot of these species depend on. They need a lot of sunlight. And um, perhaps in the past there were periodic disturbances like fire or, or logging, or I'm not sure what, that, that kept a more patchy landscape with different opportunities. Um, in this case, humans did it, and it turned out really well. It's kind of another surprising, surprising part of this. I'm not sure. No, to the second answer. We didn't catch any on the on the game camera, and we haven't done winter surveys. Um, but definitely possible. We're going to hopefully spend some more time out there. We've enlisted the help of U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife um, in depart in inland inland fisheries and wildlife. Uh, in terms of vernal pools, uh, they're all everything we found, except for maybe some of the floodplain, are man-made features. They're drainages that were put in as part of the golf course development several decades ago. Um, they're providing habitat for the vernal pool indicators, wood frogs, spotted salamanders. Um, and I think we identified four that we knew had were provided for providing breeding habitat, but we got out there really late in the breeding season, so we sort of limited it to that. Um, I think uh, natural areas, main natural areas program is going to survey some of the site this spring, I believe. I talked to Kristen. Um, so there's still work to be done on that, um, but yeah, we didn't find any like natural, main, main defined um, I want to thank Rich and Kelsey for doing this tonight. They have very busy lives and very busy jobs with a lot of other projects besides ours that they're going out and doing their thing and, and um, research and reports and investigation and game cameras. And hard driving boss. I'm glad actually that Jim stood up because I was certainly going to recognize Jim Boyle, who's principal of Boyle Associates and our senator and co chair, chair of the Natural Resources Committee um, in the legislature. We're very lucky to have somebody um, in that position in our neighborhood who's representing conservation interests in, um, in Augusta for us. Um, and um, Boyle Associates, of course, was retained as, as professionally to conduct the ecological assessments, but they've really been tremendous partners in this project. They're volunteering their time to come here tonight and speak, and, and, and I'm also glad Jim mentioned the MNRCP grant. Um, they really hustled us. They banged on our door and they said, you guys have to apply for this grant. And we thought, you know, they're just making a big deal of these wetlands. You know, they do this every day, and they really get psyched about wetlands. And, you know, yeah, 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 we know they're wetlands. They said, no, no, you really have to apply for this grant. These are unusual wetlands. So um, really it was thanks to their um, um, encouragement and, and persistence that we um, sort of threw all hands on deck to apply for that grant, and we were thrilled to be ranked first in southern Maine among the applicants on, and received a major grant that really helped us reach our goal for fundraising and acquire this property, so thank you very much. And as a small token of our appreciation um, for Boyle Associates, a picture of the property and a plaque for your offices, which are very modest. <laughs> <laughs> to, to add to something Paul said, Jeremy is a madman, so <laughs> he's very much deserving of the credit. So. Here, 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 here. Um, thank you all for coming. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, first, don't, you don't have to rush off. Um, we do have some wonderful refreshments to um, chat with folks, ask more questions of the Boyle staff. Um, Coming up Saturday, June 1st, Saturday, June 1st, Saturday, June 1st, and print that in your brain, that's when we'll have a formal dedication at the property and a chance for you to see what just been presented here tonight. Um, it happens to be National Trails Day, and we thought we would pick that day, Harvey, to dedicate the Elaine Stimson Warren Woods, and we're really excited about it. Um, um, and even though uh, there were flakes outside as we arrived, Spring is on the way. This is always the way it happens in Maine. You know, it never is 
a smooth trajectory. Um, so uh, people will be getting outdoors more. We have four properties with public trails. Keep them in mind when you're eager to get outside for some fresh air and walk around. Fuller Farm, Libby River Farm, Sewell Woods, and Broadturn Farm. They all have trails. Maps are on our website. There's some information up back. Um, so see you next year. And thank you again for coming. And thanks for all your support.